Alright, the purpose of this video is to introduce the last unit on equilibrium in grade 12 chemistry. It's called solubility equilibrium. We're going to be looking at the equilibrium involving, involving dissolving of different salts in water. So aqueous equilibria again. Consider what happens when you dissolve a salt in water. Salt is an ionic compound, so we know it's made almost always with a metal cation. Sometimes it'll have a non-metal complex cation, like the ammonium ion, but usually it'll be a metal, sodium, potassium, copper, something like that, bonded to a non-metal anion. So that's the basic definition of a, an ionic compound. You may not be familiar, though, with what it looks like at the atomic particulate level, and that's what you see in this picture. You'll notice in the picture that there's a bunch of larger purple spheres, those might be the anions, and then the small red spheres in the middle, those are the cations. And you notice they're in a very regular, uh, what's called a lattice structure. They're in a very regular pattern in a solid state. When you drop that solid into water, the water molecules are attracted to the positive and negative ions, and they pull them away from the salt crystal. So the ions are initially attracted to each other, but the fact is they're also attracted to polar water molecules. So water will pull them away from the solid. That process where the ions are leaving the solid state and going into the aqueous state, dissolved in the water, is called dissociation. So the ions are dissociating from the solid into their aqueous state in the water. However, once you get some ions floating in the water, we know from our kinetics unit, collision theory, that some of those aqueous ions will collide with the undissolved solid crystal. So they will return to the crystal. They're going to be attracted again by the positive and negative ions in the crystal lattice structure. So we say that the ions begin to precipitate or crystallize again. Now initially, if you again think back to the kinetics unit, that initially the rate of dissociation is much larger than the rate of precipitation. And that's because there's lots of ions in the solid crystal to dissociate, and initially there's very few ions floating in the water. However, as more and more ions dissociate into the water, the rate of precipitation will increase. Eventually, the rate of dissociation becomes equal to the rate of precipitation. And now, if you're thinking equilibrium, you realize we have an equilibrium situation. When the rates of the forward and reverse reactions are equal, you're at equilibrium. So an equilibrium system is one where the dissociation rate, or the dissolving, if you like, is equal to the rate of precipitation or crystallization. We say, and this is really important, we'd say looking at that solution that it's now saturated. A saturated solution is one where it appears that no more solute is dissolving. It's reached its maximum concentration. A saturated solution is an equilibrium system. That's hugely important that you understand that. When the system is at equilibrium, it has become saturated with the salt in the water. Again, looking at the ions a little bit more closely, we, we see in this picture some sodium chloride crystal. All right, the sodiums are the little blue spheres, and the larger green spheres are the chloride ions. And we see water molecules, H2O, and look at how they're pulling the ions away from the crystal. And look what happens when the ions get into the water. If you're a sodium ion, Na positive, look at how those water molecules are oriented. The negatively charged oxygen atom in the water molecules is attracted to the positively charged sodium cation. So the water molecules there have their red oxygen atoms pointing towards the sodium. We say the sodium's being hydrated. It's being surrounded by the water molecules. The chloride ion is negatively charged, and so it also gets hydrated. It also gets surrounded by water molecules. But now look at the way the water molecules are oriented, and you'll notice it's the positive hydrogen ions, in the, or rather hydrogen atoms in the water, 
that are pointing towards the negative chloride ion. So water is attracted to both the positive and the negative ions. When the solution becomes saturated, we know that no more solid is going to be dissolving, no net solid will dissolve. Of course, the dissolving is always happening, but the precipitating is happening at the same rate, so the mass of undissolved salt doesn't change. The concentrations of all the ions in the solution become constant when you're in a saturated solution. All right, so the saturated solution is at equilibrium. Because there's an equilibrium, we can anticipate writing equilibrium expressions, writing ice tables, and all of that. And this is, again, the last unit where this will apply. So hopefully by now it's getting familiar to you. Um, here's a typical example. We're dissolving a solid salt, silver sulfate, Ag2SO4, in water. When it dissolves, it dissociates into its ions. And at equilibrium, in the saturated solution, this reaction is at equilibrium. So notice you begin with a solid silver sulfate, Ag2SO4, solid, and it simply dissociates. It breaks apart into two silvers. Now, why two silvers? That's because in the formula, there was a two there for Ag2. However, we know that the sulfate ion is SO4 2 minus. So although there's a 4 beside the SO4, we know that that doesn't mean 4 sulfates. There's only one sulfate ion in that formula. So it en ends up breaking into two silvers, and we don't write the 1, but there's one sulfate ion um, produced as well. Notice that the ions are aqueous while the original solute was solid. And think about the, the significance of that when we write the equilibrium expression. Okay, so the equilibrium expression for this reaction, we're going to call it KSP, and the SP, as you see down below, stands for solubility product. So this is sometimes called the solubility product constant, and this is sometimes called the solubility product expression, this entire equation. It's just an equilibrium constant, it's just an equilibrium expression, but has the special name solubility product constant, so KSP. It's equal to the concentration of silver squared times the concentration of sulfate. The silver sulfate is left out of the expression because it was a solid, right? Solids and liquids are not included in equilibrium expressions. That means in all of these types of reactions in this unit, we always start with a solid and we finish with aqueous ions. So in all of our equilibrium expressions in this unit, there will be no denominators. There will only be a product of concentrations. And that's why it's, it's called a solubility product constant, because we're multiplying the concentrations of the two ions raised to the power of their coefficients. There's no denominator. We're only going to be interested in this unit in salts which have very low solubility in water. In fact, some of them are so low in solubility, you'd be tempted to call them insoluble. However, no salt is completely insoluble. All salts will dissociate even to a very, very tiny amount. They'll dissociate a little bit. All right, now, the size of the equilibrium constant, just like in the acid unit and in the earlier equilibrium unit, reflects how much product you make. So when your KSP value is small, like 10 to the minus 33 is very small, that salt will tend to be less soluble in water. Now, as we'll see later, it's not quite that simple, though. You can't just look at the KSP values generally and rank solubilities. We'll explain that later as to why there's a problem there. But as a generally true statement, when KSPs are small, the solubility will be small also. That's a fair thing to say. So notice we're only looking at salts here that have small KSP values. In your data booklets on page 9, you have a bigger table like this one. It's full of KSP values, and again, you'll notice there's no large KSP values on that table. 
we're not looking at salts which have high solubility, we're only looking at salts with low solubilities. Let's try to put this into practice. Here are two salts, iron 3 hydroxide with the formula FeOH3 and silver chromate, Ag2CrO4. For each of them, write the, F the chemical reaction for the dissociation in water, just like you saw on the previous slide for silver sulfate, and then write the expression for KSP as well. If you have a data booklet with you, include the value of the KSP for each of the salts. Pause the video if you think you know what you're doing and try that yourself. So I'll use the first example here. Iron hydroxide we know starts off as a solid and it dissociates into one iron ion, so Fe3+. Now how did I know that was 3+. The reason, looking at the formula and thinking some grade 11 chemistry, there's three hydroxides bonded to the one iron. And I know from our acid base unit that hydroxides have a charge of minus one. So the three hydroxides are also going to be pro produced. Since there's three negatives, the iron had to have a charge of three positive. So there's the equation for the dissociation. The KSP, capital KSP, looking it up in, on page 9 in my data booklet, iron 3 hydroxide, there it is, 2.8 times 10 to the minus 39. Wow, that's a really, really small um, KSP value. So 2.8 times 10 to the minus 39 will equal the concentration of the products, Fe. 3 plus concentration times the hydroxide concentration cubed, right? And there's no, there's no denominator because the iron hydroxide was solid. So there's the equilibrium expression for this reaction. Doing the same thing for silver chromate, if you're a little rusty with your charges on the ions or you don't recognize some complex ions, Look on page 6 in your data booklet and you'll find a list of complex ions as well as a table of simple ions where you, you would find, if you didn't know it, that silver has a charge of plus 1 and chromate, CrO4, has a charge of 2 minus. So page 6 of your data booklet will be your friend in this unit if you're rusty with your ions and their charges. So the solid silver chromate will dissociate, and notice there's two silver ions in the formula, so we'll produce two Ag positives, aqueous, and then that chromate is CrO4, that entire thing, so there's only one chromate in that formula, CrO4, and its charge, since it has two silvers bonded to it, is two minus or because I looked it up on page 6 and saw that its charge is 2 minus, and it's also going to be aqueous. We got a little lazy with, with phases in the acid-base unit, leaving them out of most of our equations. In this unit, I'd, I'd like you to put them back in. So solid for the reactants here, because those are salts that are dissolving, and aqueous for the ions, because those are the ions produced after dissolving in water. The KSP for silver chromate will equal, turning back to my data booklet, page 9, silver chromate, there we are, 1.1 times 10 to the minus 12, 1.1 times 10 to the minus 12. Now, KSP values are experimentally determined, so if you look them up in a different book, you might find a slightly different value for the KSP. Don't be shocked if that happens. I'll try to use values from our data booklet on a regular basis. So it's going to equal, looking at the products, concentration of the silver ion squared times the concentration of the chromate ion to the power of 1. Okay, now things to watch out for here, do not leave your charges out, be sure you're including the charges in the ions, so don't just write Ag, write Ag positive, and CrO4 2 minus, 
okay? Be careful with that. And again, remember they're called solubility product constants because you're only multiplying concentrations. They'll never be dividing because the reactants are always going to be a solid state. All right, with that little mini lesson, you can try questions 1 to 8 in your in your solubility equilibrium supplementary problems. You should be able to do that, and we'll look at it together in class. Good luck.